Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome. Thank you for joining us. We're going to get started, even though one of our speakers, I think, is still on the way through uh, checking into the building. But uh, we want to take advantage of the time we have. So again, thank you for joining us. Uh, my name is Richard Schmierer. Uh, I'm the chairman of the board of the Middle East Policy Council. I'm very pleased to welcome you on behalf of the council um, to our 87th quarterly Capitol Hill Conference. Oh, here we go. We're just getting started. Welcome. Thanks for joining us. Uh, we're particularly pleased today to have with us uh, such a distinguished group of panelists uh, to discuss what we all know to be a very timely topic, and that is U.S. commitments in the Middle East, advice to the Trump administration. Before I introduced the panelists, I would like to say a few words about the Council and its programs. Our organization was established in 1981. Uh, for the purpose of promoting dialogue and education concerning the U.S. and the countries of the Middle East. We have three flagship programs. Uh, one, our quarterly Capitol Hill conferences, such as today's event. Uh, a second is our quarterly journal, Middle East Policy, uh, which enjoys a wide circulation uh, in the region and among those interested in the region. Uh, it can be found uh, actually in 11,000 libraries Worldwide, There were some sample copies uh, out on the desk. Our most recent uh, issue has a very good um, piece on the same topic that we're discussing uh, today, uh, in a sense. It was, it was the Middle East and the new administration. Uh, and then our third program is an educational outreach program geared primarily towards high school students and teachers, uh, providing both materials and speakers uh, for such uh, audiences. So I, please, I would encourage you to visit us uh, on our website, www.mepc.org, uh, and our Teach Mideast website, uh, www.teachmideast.org, uh, to learn more about our activities. Now to today's event. Uh, this program is being uh, live streamed on our website, and so I'm glad to welcome uh, all of you who have logged in to view the program uh, over the internet. Uh, the proceedings will be posted uh, in video and transcript form on our website, uh, and a recap of the discussion will also be posted there. Uh, an edited transcript of the program will be published in the next issue of our journal, uh, Middle East Policy. Uh, and I think you all saw uh, the bios of our, our panelists uh, in the invitations and, and from the, the front table. But let me just briefly introduce you um, to the four of them and in the order in which they'll be speaking. Our first speaker will be uh, Derek Cholet. Uh, he's held senior positions in both the White House and the Department of Defense during the Obama administration. Uh, and he is currently, I believe, very recently promoted to um, a new position at the, um, uh, at the German Marshall Fund. Uh, where uh, he is now the executive vice president. So congratulations to Derek on that. Our second speaker uh, is a colleague uh, from my time. At, we were together at the State Department, Jake Sullivan. Uh, Jake has been both at the White House uh, and the State Department during the Obama administration. Uh, and he's had, he was the senior policy advisor on Secretary Clinton's uh, 2016 presidential uh, campaign. Our third speaker, uh, who just joined us, will be Dimitri Symes, who's the president and CEO of the Center for the National Interest, uh, which he has led for more than two decades, and is the publisher of the journal The National Interest. And then our, our final uh, speaker will be Mary Beth Long. Uh, Mary Beth has served as a senior in senior positions in the Department of Defense uh, on the, in the George W. Bush administration, and is the founder and CEO of the security consulting firm uh, Metis Solutions. Uh, the discussion uh, following the presentation uh, by our panelists will be moderated by my colleague, Dr. Tom Mater, the Executive Director of the Middle East Policy Council. Uh, Tom has uh, lived in and published uh, on the region, uh, was previously the Director of Research at the Council, and has served as the Council's Executive Director since 2009. Uh, following the opening remarks uh, by our, our panelists, we will have a Q&A session. And please note on your chairs that we have index cards placed around the room. We would ask that as any question comes to mind during the presentation of any of the panelists, you write down the question and hold up the card. Uh, 
our staff will gather the cards and bring them up to Tom, and he can then start working through them during the presentations by selecting the, the uh, questions and, and the topics that are being raised um, in the, um, through, uh, through your questions. Um, so without further ado then, let me turn it over to you, Derek. Oh, yeah, you can stay there. That's fine. Sure. Well, it's, it's much oh, better we have video. the video would be better if you came up. That would be great. All right. Well, thanks. Uh, thanks, Rich, for that kind introduction, Tom. It's good to see you. And thanks to the council for having uh, us here this afternoon. It's great to be on a panel sharing the stage with my good friend Jake and uh, Dimitri and my uh, one of my predecessors at, in my last job in the. Uh, Defense Department, Mary Beth, uh, for this very timely and important discussion. I thought what I would do to kind of kick things off is to offer some observations about what the new team, uh, Trump uh, administration, will be inheriting uh, in U.S. policy in the Middle East, offer some thoughts about how we got here, uh, what President Obama has tried to achieve uh, in the eight years he has been in office, but also some of the challenges he has faced along the way. Uh, and then to I really ask some questions, which we can get into in the Q&A, or uh, uh, my colleagues may help answer about uh, issues, policy issues for the new administration and, and what we should be looking for in terms of course corrections, changes, shifts, uh, and when it comes to U.S. policy in the Middle East. So first to, to how we got here. There's no question that President Obama, when he took office eight years ago, sought to recalibrate the U.S. approach to the Middle East. Uh, I don't uh, see the, the initial policy as, as one of a dramatic shift, but more of a, of a recalibration along several lines. I mean, first, uh, and this is probably the area where there was the most dramatic shift, of course, was the withdrawal from Iraq. Uh, much has been discussed in the last several years about the wisdom of that withdrawal, but of course that was something that President Obama campaigned on uh, in 2008, and in many ways that was the policy he inherited uh, in 2009, building on the SOFA agreement that Rich and his colleagues uh, uh, their hard work brought across the finish line in November of 2008 uh, with the outgoing Bush administration, which set the timeline for withdrawal of U.S. troops uh, from Iraq between 2009 and 2011. Uh, the second element of Obama's recalibration uh, of, in the Middle East was, of course, dealing with the Iranian nuclear threat. And in many ways, if you look back at the Obama approach, it's sort of a quintessential long game play, where the United States found itself in early 2009 out of position when it came to dealing with the Iranian nuclear threat, which had gotten demonstrably worse uh, during the course of the 2000s. And the United States found itself in the position of being an outlier in the world, where uh, many countries, particularly our European partners, saw that our lack of engagement in dealing with the problem was, in fact, the source of, of uh, our difficulties, not the other way around. So from the very beginning of Obama's time in office, in fact, from his first inaugural address, when he talked about reaching out to adversaries with that outstretched hand, he tried to change the power dynamic and the leverage, where instead of the Iranians having leverage over us, we tried to create leverage over them. First by testing engagement, the full expectation that that would not work, but therefore it proved to the world that the Iranians were in fact not interested uh, in dealing with us without significant pressure put on them. And so that then laid the groundwork for the pressure campaign that was started in 2009 by Secretary Clinton in trying to rally the world successfully uh, to put unprecedented sanctions on Iran, but also on the military side of the equation as we were withdrawing U.S. forces from Iraq, ensuring that the United States maintained the military footprint in the region to keep the pressure on Iran, and then began an effort, or really accelerated an effort, to ensure that our partners in the region got significant military capabilities uh, to defend themselves and to deter Iran. The third area of, of recalibration uh, in the region, which was the subject of some controversy still today, was an attempt to reset relations with the Muslim world. Obviously talking a lot about a different kind of reset of relations right now, but with the Muslim world, of course, with the Cairo speech in June of 2009 was the kind of the key moment for that, where the president, in terms of both the ideas and the concepts, but also the policies to back those up, tried to uh, start afresh with uh, the Muslim world and trying to, to work away at some of the scar tissue that had been built up in the previous 
uh, eight years in terms of uh, U.S. relationships with not just not the governments in that region, but more importantly, the people of that region. Uh, I think that's one area where expectations were, were set too high, and I think one of the, the dynamics that the Obama administration had to grapple with in the course of its presidency post Cairo was one of dashed expectations about the promise of Cairo uh, being quite bold and ambitious, but the reality never quite matching that, that great promise. But then, uh, and then finally, or finally in terms of policy, the Middle East peace process. Of course, it was a decision early on to appoint a senior envoy, uh, Senator Mitchell, to uh, try to rejuvenate efforts to bring uh, the Israelis and Palestinians closer to peace. It was something that, that Secretary Clinton uh, spent a good deal of time on, Secretary Kerry spent even more time on. But that was, that was clearly, an, from the early days, an effort by the administration to recalibrate the U.S. approach to the region. But then, and finally, and kind of more broadly, I think there was a, an effort early on that really carried through the course of his presidency, even up until his speech last night, which was to uh, try to address this notion and maybe it's, it's an illusion that there's a U.S. fix to every problem in the Middle East. It's not to say the U.S. has no role to play uh, in, in, in trying to address the, the great challenges and threats in the Middle East, but that if there's not a single set of policies that the U.S. alone can lead to a solution. And, uh, you know, Jeff Goldberg, uh, the journalist, he talks about it's the, the Carly Simon syndrome trying to address this. It's not everything is about us. And also, uh, we can't necessarily uh, alone fix all of these problems. Uh, now, that's led to a lot of anxieties in the region. And this gets to the second part of what I wanted to get into uh, in terms of the, the challenges the president has faced. Because there's no question that there is a lot of anxiety in the region among longstanding partners about the United States, our approach to the, to the challenges in their neighborhood, and what role that we will play moving forward in helping them address those challenges. The region is going through a once-in-a-century set of changes, a, a convulsion in terms of its security, in terms of its borders, in terms of uh, its economic and social order. That's fundamentally not about the United States, it's not about any particular U.S. policy, but it, of course, has huge ramifications on the United States, and it creates a lot of uh, anxieties in the region about their own future. And so it points up this challenge of reassurance. Uh, I think there's great doubts about the U.S. role. I think there's several reasons for that, uh, one of which is greater energy independence for the United States. And as, as the, the, the energy picture changes and so dramatically here, there's a question upon particularly some of our Arab allies that we will rely on them less, and so they may have less leverage on us. I think it's important to note that this effort of greater energy independence actually started, it predates Obama. It, it was President George W. Bush in his 2006 State of the Union address, who talked about an American addiction uh, to oil from the Middle East and promised over the next several years to have a 75% reduction in U.S. Uh, 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 reliance on Middle East oil. So I think, I mean, clearly that, that that kind of approach creates doubts among many of our Arab partners about our, our continuing reliance on them and whether we're going to be there for them in the future. Obviously, the Arab Spring itself, which, as I said, was not about any set of U.S. policies, but the convulsion that we all saw in starting in late 2010, early 2011, caused many of our closest allies in the region to question their own future and whether they were going to, whether the same thing that was happening on the streets of Tunis or Cairo or Damascus was going to be coming to them. Uh, and then, of course, we're worried about our own, the U.S. responses to that and this sort of, this, this narrative that set in about the U.S. abandoning uh, someone like Mubarak, which I, I, I reject that, that narrative, but I, I can see that it's out there. A lot of anxiety in the region about the, the rebalance to Asia. I mean, one of the great strategic moves of the Obama administration, uh, and frankly, one of, one of the areas of, of Obama's foreign policy that probably has the most bipartisan support uh, is the rebalance to Asia. But one of the unintended consequences of that strategy was the the insecurities that it created around those countries who were seen as being rebalanced away from. Uh, you saw it in Europe, certainly. You see it in the Middle East. I mean, it's an interesting dynamic that Jake will remember well, where when, when uh, the Obama administration officials would talk to Asian allies, we would have to reassure them that we really meant it about the rebalance and to say that we wouldn't be distracted by problems elsewhere, that we would follow up on this, 
rhetoric to rebalance the Asia Pacific. But of course, our friends in the Middle East and elsewhere heard that it was going to be even less time and attention for them. Uh, and then also, clearly, this, the, the Obama's rhetoric about U.S. quote-unquote non-intervention. Again, going back to this, this earlier recalibration, that there's not a U.S. fix for every problem. This perception in the region the U.S. could always be doing more, and why isn't it doing more, uh, was something that created a lot of anxiety uh, uh, in the region and, and, and compounded this challenge of reassurance. There are also diverging interests. And as the United States uh, tried to seek about a diplomatic solution with, on the nuclear, Iran nuclear program, which meant a Secretary of State talking quite frequently with his Iranian counterpart, something that had not happened at all since uh, 1979. I mean, just even in the course of this administration, we went from a situation where we would have uh, hours and hours of, of, of meetings in the situation room about whether if an Iranian diplomat and uh, a U.S. official were found in the same room together at a large international conference, uh, if they were going to be allowed to like, look at each other in the eye, to a Secretary of State, John Kerry, regularly text messaging and talking to his Iranian counterpart in the course of the Iran nuclear negotiations. That's a pretty dramatic shift, a perception shift for, that for many of our allies was very unsettling. Uh, clearly the situation in Syria and the desire by many U.S. partners in the region for the U.S. to do more in Syria, to be more militarily engaged, to take on Assad more frontally, and the Obama administration's resistance to that created some sense of anxiety. And then, of course, as I mentioned earlier, the situation with Egypt, where there is a sense, particularly some, with some of our Gulf partners, that the, that the Obama administration was too quick to, uh, to dismiss uh, Mubarak, which I think overstates both our our agency in that process, but also what was actually happening on the ground. And then finally, it's, the Obama administration has struggled with managing the trade-offs between what we're doing in the Middle East and what we would do in other regions. And I, you know, I think even though the U.S. has fewer limits than any other country in terms of what it can do in its capabilities, we still can't do it all. Uh, and to the extent the U.S. is doing more in places like the Asia Pacific, doing more in the last several years in Europe in terms of military posture, in terms of diplomatic energy and effort, uh, it's, it's, it's been perceived as less in the Middle East. And dealing with that balance that the, the Obama administration has tried to maintain and in how it's dealing with problems around the world has, uh, has meant that for many in the Middle East there is this sense that we care less. Um, and that's why I think that there's been this myth, as I see it, of U.S. disengagement for the region. Okay, that's why I'm very careful to say it's a recalibration. It's not, it's not a disengagement. It's not a retrenchment. I think it's often easier to say that it's, you know, the, the, all the problems of the Middle East is because the U.S. is doing, quote, unquote, less. It's, it's easier to say that than to um, grapple with the more complex story of what's actually happening uh, inside uh, the Middle East. Um, and when I look across the landscape of what the U.S. is currently doing in the Middle East, I see a, a, a U.S. that has uh, shepherded through some record-setting arms deals to our Gulf Arab partners in terms of the most modern uh, capabilities uh, to the Saudis, the Emiratis, and others. I uh, see a, uh, a security framework that is more robust today than it was a decade ago in terms of the level of diplomatic and military interaction the United States has with its Gulf partners through this Camp David process that President Obama launched and that was continue on last year in, in Saudi Arabia, where the U.S. and its GCC partners are trying to do what we do in other regions of the world routinely, in Europe and Asia, which is to have a regular meeting of the leaders where we can talk about common security issues and common solutions to those problems. Look at the relationship with Israel, which has had no shortage of drama at the highest levels over the last eight years, but yet for those of us working uh, down in the trenches, we saw security partnership that stronger uh, in many ways than it's ever been. Uh, the president on his way out the door signed off on a record-setting uh, agreement with the Israelis, the Memorandum of Understanding, understanding to provide them $38 billion over the next 10 years, a uh, level of cooperation between our military and security services that uh, has never happened before. Uh, even look at Egypt. Uh, again, a, a country in which the U.S. was criticized for not doing, for being too quick to overthrow Mubarak, but on the other side, uh, or to be complicit, supposedly, in overthrowing Mubarak, but 
On the other side, this administration has been criticized for not cutting off Egypt in terms of the military assistance we provide uh, Egypt, for maintaining uh, the military relationship with Egypt. So it's criticized not for disengaging, but for continuing to engage. And then finally, our military footprint, which despite our withdrawal from Iraq uh, in 2011, uh, we, and, and even if you set aside the, the capabilities we have in theater to fight the ISIL campaign, more military men and women deployed in the Middle East than before 9-11 in terms of our maritime and, and uh, air presence uh, quite significant. It seems to me that if you look back over the last three decades, the biggest difference between our posture today and where we were eight years ago is we don't have 150,000 troops in Iraq. And I don't know that that should be the sole measurement of U.S. engagement or disengagement uh, in the region. So what, what President Obama is leaving, in my view, is a situation that from a U.S. perspective, perspective is sustainable. It's sustainable in terms of our military footprint, and what we're doing on operations. On the ISIL campaign, uh, we've made tremendous progress over the last several years, and I think the new administration has some decisions to make about uh, what to do about the, the campaign in Mosul, when to retake Raqqa, whether they want to add special operators on the ground and change the rule of, rules of engagement uh, in places like Syria, but it's a sustainable uh, presence. Uh, and when you look at the public support that we have here in the United States, for what we're currently doing in the Middle East. This campaign that we just went through was a lot about a lot of things, but I, I heard it as, as more of an of a, of a affirmation of what we are currently doing in the Middle East um, than, than any dramatic change. And I actually anticipate with General Mattis, who I worked very closely with at the Pentagon, in many ways was a co-architect of many of the policies uh, that I've just talked about. Uh, to see a good deal of continuity, which then I'll close with this, which leads to kind of the questions that I'm looking at for a new administration coming in, uh, and I'll just tick through these very quickly in terms of both what they do and how they respond. First, obviously the Iran deal, lots of questions about whether the U.S. is going to try to throw away the Iran deal, amend the Iran deal, or end up doing something that might look quite a bit like what Secretary Clinton talked about last year, which was the vigorous implementation of the Iran deal. Second, ISIS, as I said earlier, these tactical issues which are very important about how quickly we seek to retake Mosul or Raqqa, uh, what kind of capabilities we're giving to the Syrian opposition. Again, the new administration is a bit unclear on this, everything from the president-elect suggesting that we, don't, we want to stop support for the Syrian opposition to uh, some of the uh, folks who are part of the defense uh, transition talking about how we actually want to dial up the support to the opposition. Uh, third, on Syria, the Assad question writ large. Again, we have a, we have a pretty, uh, pretty wide variety of options being thrown out there. Everything from we want to take the Putin position and work with Russia and Assad to deal with ISIL to we want to actually dial it up uh, in terms of what we're doing to squeeze Assad and get him out of power. Uh, fourth, our Gulf partnerships. Clearly, uh, uh, there's going to be a lot of questions in, in Gulf capitals about what the new, next administration is going to do. A question to my mind is, will the president-elect uh, help organize and, in fact, intend a, another summit of Gulf leaders uh, in the next six months? I think a, if the election had gone a different way, that's something I would have expected to see happen. Um, and I'm not sure if that's going to happen with this administration. That's something I hope the new team is thinking about. Uh, fifth, where areas that they decide to be disruptive, quote unquote, uh, uh, how quickly, if at all, they want to move uh, the U.S. Embassy in Israel to Jerusalem. Does the president-elect want to declare the two-state solution dead? Uh, you know, things that may not actually achieve a near-term goal, but would be very disruptive and may have some, some knockoff effects that would be unanticipated. And then finally, uh, the inevitable crisis that's coming our way. I think if there's one thing those of us who follow Middle East policy closely over the last several years have been humbled to learn and relearn is how, uh, how little in control we can be of events and how things will come up and in many cases literally blow up in our faces. And so I think that's something we can uh, unfortunately expect to see uh, in the coming months in the Middle East and how the new team handles that inevitable and probably unexpected crisis uh, uh, will be something that will matter greatly to all of us. So with that, over to Jake.
Well, thank you. Uh, thanks, everyone, for being here, and to Rich and Tom um, for putting this thing together. Uh, you know, Derek and I work very closely together, and I think you just heard a, an incredibly effective tour of the region, um, much of which I agree with. And um, to Dimitri and Mary Beth, it's, uh, it's an honor to share the stage with you. I, I'm going to pick up a little bit where Derek left off on some of the big questions facing the incoming administration. Obviously, over the course of the past two years, uh, I have given a lot of thought to the hard stuff, the really hard questions. And I think um, I'd like to use my time today, rather than give advice to the new administration, which I don't think I'm really in a position to do, or necessarily talk as much about how things might have gone if the election result had been different, is rather tee up five hard questions that the incoming administration is going to have to grapple with, which raise a series of tensions and contradictions, uh, and for which there are no easy answers. And that's not really a surprise, given the nature of the modern Middle East. Uh, of course, there's going to be these huge, difficult questions where um, the American policy is going to face dilemmas and contradictions. So I'll start with the Iran deal, uh, which is something that I care deeply about, uh, having participated in it from the inception. And obviously, on the campaign trail, we heard a huge amount about ripping up the Iran deal, getting rid of it, it's the worst thing ever, et cetera. I think that the rhetoric has changed pretty dramatically since the election, and it certainly seems to me that we are on a course to not see the Iran deal torn up uh, in the first instance, but rather uh, to see it enforced vigorously and then uh, for any additional pressure placed on Iran for that to happen in the context of things outside of the nuclear context, uh, ballistic missiles, human rights, support for terrorism. So here, to my mind, is the core challenge facing that policy, which would have faced Secretary Clinton if she had been elected president because she proposed a policy very similar to the one that I now expect the new administration and the Congress, bipartisan uh, leadership in both the House and Senate will pursue, which is vigorously enforce the deal and then try to impose costs for Iran's activities and behaviors outside of the context of the deal. The core challenge is how do you increase, dial up the pressure on Iran for what it's doing with its ballistic missile program, its support for terrorism, its abuse of human rights, without effectively reimposing exactly the same sanctions you just lifted in the course of the Iran deal and thereby blow up the deal in the process, affect what I would call a bait and switch. How do you have a credible story to tell your partners in Europe and the other members of the P5 plus one and a credible platform to stand on that says, we have a right under the deal to sanction you for your, your violations of uh, your ballistic missile obligations Viol uh, restrictions, by the way, that are embedded in UN Security Council resolutions, um, but that don't go so far as to just be the wholesale replacement of the old sanctions regime with a near identical new sanctions regime um, that was the price that was paid for the, uh, the deal in the first place. That is a big and very hard question, and getting that calibration right will be incredibly important, because if you undershoot, you're not going to put the pressure on that's needed to hold Iran accountable for these other activities. And if you overshoot, you could break up the coalition that's come together to enforce the deal, and that would put the United States in a pretty difficult position going forward. So for me, that is a big piece of business that is a little bit less strategic than it is practical. It's actually about what exactly are the tools available to us to hold the Iranians accountable for these other things, and what do we have to do from a diplomatic perspective to convince the rest of the international community that we are within our rights to do these things. I think that is going to be an early test of this administration's capacity to effectuate a complicated multi-vector strategy. The second core challenge facing this administration is that uh, the current posture talks very tough about both Iran and about ISIS. But the problem, of course, is that trying to push back on Iranian influence in the region and trying to hold Iran accountable for its behavior uh, in respect to supporting terrorist groups like Hezbollah runs headlong into a strategy that says, by any means necessary, we're going to get rid of ISIS. Much of what we heard from the president-elect on the campaign trail seemed to be a ratification of Iran's strategy in Syria. And much of what he talks about in respect to going after ISIS inside Iraq could have the 
perverse effect of actually strengthening Iran's hand in Baghdad and, and, and across Iraq. So how do you resolve that tension? How do you at once, ha once have a go tough, sign up with any partner who's willing to fight ISIS on the one hand, and a we are going to undermine and push back on and try and hold uh, Iran's feet to the fire and reduce its influence across the region on the other hand? Is it possible to thread the needle on that I'm not totally convinced that it is, and I think that both the new administration's Syria policy and Iraq policy is going to have to come down on one side or the other of this fundamental contradiction. The third issue is the larger question of Syria itself. If you listen to the weight of what we heard during the campaign, and Derek is right that you know, we heard a very wide variety of things both on the campaign and during the transition, it seemed to be in favor of essentially saying the Russians are onto something, so let them take care of it in Syria. That seemed to be the, where the weight of opinion was. Where is that ultimately going to leave Syria, though, in the long term? How do we think about actually trying to restitch some kind of stable equilibrium in Syria that reduces the killing and the slaughter of innocent civilians, that reduces the long term prospect? that even if you roust ISIS from Raqqa, you don't just get the son of ISIS or the cousin of ISIS a year or two from now because you've merely installed something akin to the status quo ante. I think this set of questions uh, is going to come home to roost for the administration very quickly, and I think they're going to find that taking a position which just says, let's support the strong man, let's let the Russians help prop up Assad and so forth, that that ultimately is going to beg a lot more questions than answers as that policy actually unfolds. And I'll be interested to hear from both Dimitri and, and Mary Beth what they actually anticipate to the extent it's possible to, uh, how this particular set of uh, questions and tensions get, gets resolved. The fourth significant question from my perspective facing the new administration goes to the president-elect's seeming predilection for supporting strong men in authoritarian regimes across the region. He loves Sisi seems to like Erdogan, seems to like the Gulf leaders for their strength and toughness. Uh, these all, in his view, can be partners against terrorist groups, against ISIS. And I think that that raises a very fundamental and profound question about U.S. policy, which is, do we really believe that the old bargain, the authoritarian bargain, which is we support regimes that have deep questions about their fundamental and staying power and legitimacy in exchange for their help to fight terrorists and to keep some measure of, of uh, regional equilibrium. Is that old bargain conceivably sustainable, uh, particularly given what we saw in 2011, 2012 with the Arab revolutions? Can we go back to just betting on the strong man do we think that that is a long-term proposition is in the best interest of U.S. national security? I have my strong doubts about that. And I wonder if we don't have to be thinking hard about the ways in which, while supporting the efforts of our partners, our Sunni partners across the region, and raising their confidence and adding reassurance, as Derek was talking about, we don't also have a clear vector of trying to encourage and induce the kinds of reforms that can lead to a more sustainable uh, future for the Middle East. I think this is going to be a big piece of business that the new administration is going to face. And it's very recent history which reminds us just how brittle and unstable a regime can become if it loses legitimacy with its people and isn't capable of embarking on a path of reform. This relates, it, it's sort of my 4A, um, you know, before moving on to my fifth and final point, to the real, um, I think, opportunity. Opportunity is always a funny word to use when you're talking about the Middle East in general and uh, the peace process in particular. But I do think that there is an interesting convergence of interests happening among our Sunni partners from Egypt to the Gulf, uh, including Jordan, and Israel. Um, they share a couple of common adversaries, Israel and um, uh, radical Islamic extremist uh, groups, terrorist groups. And um, we've seen bubbling up the appearance of increasing cooperation between Israel and these countries. 
does that present any kind of opportunity to potentially break the logjam and make progress in the Middle East peace process that gets away from just the, 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 the kinds of negotiations that we've seen over the past few years? I don't know the answer to that, but I would hope that as the new administration considers potentially precipitous moves in the early days, uh, it at least calculate the possibility that a more careful and cautious approach out of the gate could create or, or at least preserve opportunities down the road for uh, Israel, the United States, and others to convert this growing convergence of interest between the Sunni countries and Israel into some meaningful progress on the peace process. I think there is a possibility there, and I think very careful statecraft coming out of the gate will be important to, to test that possibility and see if it can actually play out. And then fifth and finally is the question of Russia's role in the Middle East. Um, I uh, could offer a number of thoughts on this topic, but the next speaker up here, Dimitri, will be able to talk about it uh, to a much greater extent than I will. So I will just start by saying that I think we've heard a number of alarming things from the president-elect on the campaign trail about his views of um, U.S. policy towards Russia. Uh, largely, we have focused that discussion around Europe, around Ukraine, around NATO, and nuclear weapons and the like. Um, but I think one must have a very clear-eyed view of what President Putin's objects are in the Middle East where they converge with U.S. interests, and where they substantially diverge with U.S. interests. And that goes not just for the situation in Syria, but for the long-term vitality of U.S. partnerships and alliances with our Sunni, with Sunni states, Egypt and Jordan and the Gulf states, um, with the peace process, with Iran and the Iran nuclear deal, and Iran's larger desire to exert regional influence. I think there are opportunities here, but I think there are also enormous pitfalls. And without going into further detail, because my colleague can talk about it to a greater extent, it seems to me that taking great care to get beyond the simple maxim that says, Putin doesn't like ISIS any more than I do, uh, and see the larger trends and dynamics at play is going to be really important, or we could find ourselves in a, in a significantly strategically worse position four years from now than we are today vis-a-vis -vis Russia and its influence across the larger Middle East. So those are questions and not answers, but from my perspective, those are the things to look at if you're starting to judge, okay, how is this country, uh, how is the United States going to resolve um, some of the major challenges facing us in the Middle East? How is this administration going to stack its priorities and make its trade-offs? And I think if you kind of make a scorecard along these five lines, it will tell you a lot about our capacity for success in the region over the next four years. Uh, so with that, I'll turn it over to Dimitri. Thank you. Thank you. Are there any questions that uh, you have written down? and? Is there someone, Zach, could you make sure someone from our staff gets them? Thank you. <clears throat> Thanks so much for the invitation. And uh, I'm familiar with the council. I know the great work you're doing, and it's a particular privilege to be here today in such distinguished company. I have to tell Jack Sullivan that he is in trouble because I'm going to agree with a lot of what you have said, <laughs> particularly about Russia. Uh, clearly, we have to start with an assumption uh, that the United States and Russia have very different interests, have often contrasting values, and Mr. Putin is not a friend of the United States. I hope uh, the president-elect also knows well that Putin is not his personal friend. Uh, actually, several years ago, uh, during one of his numerous uh, TV interviews, Mr. Putin was asked, who are your close friends? And he said, you don't understand what a job of the president involves in Russia. You cannot have any friends. 
if somebody was your close friend, he's your friend no more, because otherwise he would not be able to do your job right. And I don't think he just said it. From everything I have learned from people who know Putin, the more somebody looks like a friend, and particularly the more somebody pretends to be Putin's friend, the more vulnerable this person becomes. Mr. Putin is an elected emperor. There can be no friends. There are subjects, there are followers, there are allies, but there are no friends. Uh, and uh, the fact that he said nice things about Mr. Trump, and actually uh, in translation in English, uh, what Putin said was exaggerated. Uh, Putin never called Trump a genius. He said about uh, uh, Trump that he clearly is a capable and very colorful politician, uh, which is a kind of, uh, uh, a, kind of uh, a compliment, but a rather measured one. I think that there are other reasons, much more powerful reasons than illusions about Russia and about Putin, to think seriously about a different and a better relationship with Russia. And actually, none of these reasons are good, and none of them uh, involve uh, any positive interpretation of uh, Russian intentions. Let me start with the reason number one. If you look at challenges to the United States, the challenges this country is facing today and is likely to face in the near future, I would say the number one challenge is a strategic nuclear confrontation. It's very unlikely. We all know that. But we also all know that Russia is the only country which has a capability to destroy the United States as a prosperous democratic society. I was having a conversation with someone who knows Russia well and who was a senior official uh, in the Obama administration. And that person said to me in response uh, to an article I recently wrote with Graham Allison from the Belfast Center, he said, you're exaggerating uh, a danger of nuclear war because Putin is not crazy. And he understands that, yes, they may be able to destroy the United States, but they would be committing suicide. I buy this argument that Putin would not do something like that intentionally. Kaiser Wilhelm, President Poincaré, Emperor Nicholas II, none of them in 1914 wanted to go in this huge European slaughter intentionally. And they just thought that their peaceful intentions were clear and that the other side would know when to stop. It did not quite work out that way. Uh, we have a growing tension in Europe. We have uh, new deployments in Europe on both sides. Uh, what causes these deployments? Both sides view it in a dramatically different way. In Syria, it was initially portrayed by Moscow as an operation to help American-led coalition uh, and uh, uh, to join the United States in an anti-ISIS campaign. Uh, clearly, it evolved fairly quickly in an operation to support uh, President Assad uh, in an alliance with the Iranians. Uh, and uh, clearly, uh, both sides have very different views of what is happening now in Syria. And both sides, frankly, feel that not only, that not only their interests, but their prestige, their legitimacy are at stake. And for Mr. Putin, particularly because he can hardly prevail in Ukraine, it's very important for him politically not to look like a loser in Syria. Uh, we are very concerned, and quite legitimately, about Russian threat to small Baltic states. The Russians are concerned, understandably, about NATO infrastructure moving closer and closer to St. Petersburg and to Moscow. This is not a situation which, in my view, any responsible American president can leave unattended, just assuming that the other side would be sufficiently wise and pragmatic. That is one reason to seek a better relationship with Russia, not an alliance, not friendship, but something 
significantly more stable than our growing distrust and actually zero sum game on both sides. Second challenge to the United States is clearly ISIS. Now, the different views on how helpful Russia can be uh, against ISIS. And I am agnostic on that. And I think there are people on this panel who understand the dynamics in Syria and Iraq better than uh, I, uh, in terms of my experience and background, and able to understand. So I will remain agnostic. What I do know with certainty is that if our relationship with Russia continues to deteriorate, uh, we should entertain a possibility uh, that Russia would want to support some terrorist movements against the United States. And again, an assumption always is these are Muslim extremists, uh, they are a threat uh, to Russia uh, uh, in, uh, in the Caucasus, uh, in Central Asia, so Russia would never, never uh, ally itself with these people. Well, Russia allied itself with Hitler. It was a very short-lived alliance, but it created a lot of trouble. Uh, Russia, I don't need to tell you, supported the PLO, and uh, there are strong suspicions that it uh, supported uh, indirectly even more radical terrorist movements in the 1970s. I cannot exclude the possibility, and I don't think any serious analyst can exclude the possibility, that our relationship with Russia deteriorates further. Russia may become our opponent using a terrorist weapon against the United States. And uh, those who believe that Russia launched this huge hacking effort inside the United States, I hope they would at least entertain the possibility that Russia can use terrorists if the push comes to shove. Last, but probably most important from my standpoint, is American strategic future. As far as I am concerned, a strategic nightmare for the United States is a situation when a uh, uh, growing Chinese superpower would be joined by a resurgent Russia, because that clearly would create uh, a major, if not necessarily a full-scale alliance, but a major coalition against American interests and values. And even if uh, China and Russia do not make any formal arrangement, the very fact that the Chinese basically can count on Russian support, on Russian cooperation, clearly emboldens them in whatever they do in South China Sea and in that region in the Far East in general. As China is becoming stronger and stronger, it cannot be in the American interest to put China and Russia closer together. And as a result, I think it's very important for the United States to try to have, as Kissinger and Nixon tried to accomplish, better relations with Beijing and Moscow than they have with each other. At the minimum, we should not be doing things that would be making them closer against American interests. Now, I understand that uh, Mr. Tillerson, during his confirmation hearings today, talked about the Russian threat in Europe and Russian threat to uh, NATO allies. I think that that's very clear. Uh, we may uh, have uh, a debate about who we have arrived at our current predicament. And uh, different analysts in the United States, in Europe, and of course in Russia, they have very different explanations of whose fault it was and how all that has happened. But where we are today, it's very clear that the relationship between the United States and Russia is dominated by adversity, uh, that mistrust is very, very high, that uh, uh, military leaders, both in the United States and Russia, have a growing influence on the decision-making process, uh, that uh, both the United States and Russia pay more attention to how their actions would look to their allies, uh, to their friends, than how their actions could look to, to each other respectively, and uh, in the Russian case, how the actions could look in Europe. In my view, this is a very troublesome situation. Uh, I think that as President Reagan, as uh, President Nixon, 
uh, were doing it years ago, the way to start is from making very clear that the United States is strong and it requires spending, it requires deployments, it requires moving uh, infrastructure in Baltic states, Poland and elsewhere. Uh, I think it uh, requires reassuring our allies, and not only in NATO, but also in Asia, particularly Japan and South Korea and Taiwan. But what also requires is a meaningful diplomatic initiative vis-a-vis -vis Russia. Because as an old proverb goes, tongue without arms, how do you dare to speak? But if you have only arms, if your diplomacy is non-existent, then you are not giving another side much of an incentive to accommodate you unless you are prepared to defeat them. Uh, President Obama said on a couple of occasions that we were able to isolate Russia, uh, that uh, the Russian economy was in shables, and then after that, uh, Russia became a major military factor in Syria, and uh, after that, we have all this scandal with hacking, and you have an impression that when you back Putin into the corner, he finds a way to lash out, and sometimes in a rather disturbing way in terms of American interests. So, what should we do at this point, as far as I am concerned? What we should do at this point is first, of course, to reassure our allies and friends. Uh, in his first foreign policy speech, which uh, uh, Mr. Trump has delivered actually at our center, uh, Mr. Trump said that one of the first things he would do would be to call for a NATO summit and for a summit with our Asian allies, where he would reaffirm American commitments, but would also discuss missions of our alliances under new circumstances. I think it would be a good way to start. You don't start with Putin. You start with our allies and friends. But then I think you have to try a new beginning with Russia, as was tried, of course, by the first Bush administration, as was tried, uh, of course, by the Clinton administration, as was tried, of course, by the Obama administration. And the question is, why all those efforts have failed? And of course, there were a lot of explanations connected to the Russian behavior and Russian own priorities and Russian own circumstances. But I will give you one reason why I think Mr. Trump may have an opportunity. I think that for the first time since the end of the Cold War, a lot of people in the United States and in Europe are beginning to take Russia seriously, are beginning to come to a conclusion that Russia cannot be ignored, that you cannot take a position, well, this is an upper Volta with nuclear weapons. Uh, these people are nobodies. Uh, they can be safely ignored. Uh, we should tell them, uh, well, uh, we love you, we respect you, but basically their perspectives could be safely discounted. I think we know now this is not the case. I think that we should accept that we need to engage in a serious negotiation with Russia about Syria, and I completely agree that we cannot uh, allow Russia to impose its agenda on Syria and achieve a unilateral victory. And I think that it's very clear that we cannot allow Russia not only to threaten Baltic states, but also uh, to dismember Ukraine. But I also think that we should have a serious conversation. Uh, we should accept that Russia also is entitled to security. They are entitled to security not because they are good people, not because uh, we believe that uh, they are pure at heart or that they are friends, but because if we do not negotiate security arrangements, which would be minimally acceptable to them, they would be looking for security in other ways, which would be detrimental to uh, American interests. And when I look at uh, specific proposals on the table, both in terms of Ukraine and in terms of Syria, I do believe that uh, we will need to engage in some heavy lifting but I think a lot of things are doable, and I think that Mr. Trump is likely to be more pragmatic uh, than his campaign rhetoric would suggest. Uh, and I completely agree, actually, with both of you on Iran, that we cannot abandon the agreement. And if you want to know the final reason why we should not abandon the agreement, because if we abandon this agreement, 
Mr. Trump would have great difficulty having any new beginning with Russia, because Russia is allied with Iran. And if Iran uh, would run to the Russians and would ask for their support, before we even started uh, developing a new relationship with Moscow, uh, we may not like how Putin would behave, and any new initiative toward Moscow would likely to be short-lived. So I, I, I hope that there will be new openness to Moscow, that there will be new seriousness in terms of reaching diplomatic understandings, but also, as two previous speakers have suggested, that there would be an element of responsible continuity. Hi. Well, the first thing I want to do is thank the Council for the very gracious invitation to join uh, this really august group um, and all of you out there. For those of you out there who weren't intelligence officers, the, the former CIA officer and myself hopes that all of you and the incoming administration were listening very carefully to what Dimitri said. Um, I think it was very wise. Um, the former DOD official in me says that uh, both Derek and Jake, um, it's really a pleasure to sit at the same table with you. I think it's very difficult to overstate how impossible both of their jobs were. Um, and they um, are still alive and their families are probably still nominally together, um, <laughs> but they really deserve a thanks to all of us. Um, and I think one of the great things about working in the Middle East is whether you're from a Democratic or a Republican administration, um, the problems and the players basically are the same. And there's much more commonalities of interests and of problems than one suspects. So much of what I would have to say would um, agree with um, at least some of what Derek and Jake said. So I'll try to skip ahead and do a little bit of an examination of what I believe to be um, sort of the outline of what the incoming administration will be looking at or taking position-wise vis-a-vis the Middle East. This is certainly not based on any role that I have with the Trump administration. I'm, I'm not involved either directly or indirectly. This is just based on my having talked to some folk and careful reading and what I understand to be some advice that they're getting. So just starting out, I think that from uh, the incoming administration's point of view, there really is going to be a, a realignment, uh, so to speak, of interests. Um, where they will, there will be departures um, in, in, their, in their view from um, what has been the, um, the posture, the policy uh, that they are inherited. And I think the, the first one would be much more, from their point of view, a much more transactional, much more pragmatic ap approach. This is what I need. What do you need to give it to me? And one of the results of that will be uh, things that may have muddied the water in the past. Uh, will you do this for me? How many Gitmo? Uh, detainees will you take for me if I do this? Um, how will you vote on certain things in the UN if you give me that? I think you, you probably will see a lot less of that. Um, and from many, I think, Middle Eastern standpoints, it was very difficult at times to determine what exactly was the White House strategy on certain things, um, Syria being one. There was long suspicions um, by many of the Gulf states um, of exactly what it was the, um, the president was trying to accomplish in Iran. Um, and unfortunately, I think the Atlantic Council or the Atlantic article that came out in which the president um, specifically said he thought it was time that Persia or Iran took its rightful place in, in, the, in the region and that uh, Saudi Arabia in particular was going to have to live with it. I think for good or for ill, that confirmed a lot of the deeply held undercurrents of many of the Gulf states that this really was uh, an attempt to lift up uh, Iran um, to the detriment um, of the other regional allies and without their participation, more importantly. Um, it's important to remember that the, in previous attempts in, in most of the administrations, frankly, P5 plus one, P5 plus whatever, uh, didn't involve any of the regional players directly, which I think um, hopefully is something that we've all learned is a big mistake, particularly when you have uh, an agreement with Iran about a nuclear power in which you have um, the, the power that's getting the agreement making continuous statements about death to America, um, the fact that Bahrain is part of um, its existing empire for which it will, um, it hopes to, re, uh, to reassert itself, same with the islands off of 
of the UAE, and yet none of those, none of those countries were at the table. So I do think you are going to see a departure, um, or at least in, in the incoming administration's mind, a departure. And I think from their point of view, it'll be transactional and pragmatic based on U.S. interests, a clear interest that they have identified, most likely through a domestic lens. I think this president believes he was elected with a very strong domestic agenda and that his foreign policy, America First, um, will be through a domestic lens. What does this do for the American people, whether it's foreign policy writ large, whether it's trade, et cetera? And I think part of that will be his attempt to, in, in, in this incoming administration's mind, to reassert American leadership in the region. Um, personally, uh, I, the contacts I have in the region um, are, um, have been suffering uh, from what they believe to be uh, either an a indirect or direct uh, withdrawal in their minds from the region. Part of it may be, as um, one of the speakers explained, a misinterpretation of the balance, uh, the pivot to Asia. Part of that may be um, what many believe to be the premature withdrawal from Iraq uh, and leaving it in the state it's in. Some of it may be just a lack of attention and um, exacerbated by the attention put on Iran. But certainly there's a sense that America has vacated um, there's a, been a power vacuum, and that power vacuum has been assumed by both Iran and Russia that have taken advantage of the lack of a forceful policy um, by the United States and a lack of U.S. leadership, particularly on certain issues, and that now the incoming administration and um, our traditional allies in the region are paying the consequences. So I think that you'll see a reassertion of that, uh, principally um, uh, and I think Mike Flynn has been very clear about this, in the area of restoring our leadership vis-a-vis um, -vis ISIS uh, or our terrorism and working with those who, uh, with whom we have shared um, goals on terrorism, um, particularly ISIS, and looking very carefully at the core reasons um, of extremist violent Islam, uh, which will be re returning, I think, to uh, covert action or public affairs, strategic communications, whatever you want to call it, uh, that we used um, in the Cold War when we directly attacked the underpinnings of communism of the Soviet Union, um, of however you want to characterize um, that particular ideology or theology. But the bastardization, the use, the improper use, the abhorrent use of our religion, of Islam for power grabbing for violence and for acts that in fact are in contravention of um, Islamic principles. I think you will see a real effort um, to, in, in that direction. Um, in the context of shared interests, I think you're going to see a recognition very early on, um, and this is my third point, that this is by far the most violent region in the world. And while you might want to pivot to um, to uh, Southeast Asia, to China, um, and uh, certainly pay attention to what Russia is doing. You certainly, you cannot afford to turn your attention away or to blink or to leave a power vacuum in the Middle East. Um, and there are three primary reasons for that. The one is the existential threat to Israel and to the United States from an interballistic or a ballistic missile or nuclear armed Iran. And we can have a long discussion about whether or not the Iranian agreement is in fact um, something that should be either modified or abandoned. My personal opinion is it can't be abandoned, but we, it's, it's also uh, not a document that we all can live with to the extent it's not doing what it's supposed to do, and that is pr providing U.S. and regional safety. And I think there's a lot of debate right now as to whether that uh, document actually does that, and a lot of controversy as to if indeed the, the, the agreement itself is designed and can provide the safety in a deferred nuclear ability, why is it we spent $150 billion in cash um, to the Iranians and didn't really want to talk about it uh, in order to do what as part of this agreement? And then another $400 million for sailors that were kidnapped literally as the document was being signed in order to uh, pay a ransom to get them back. This is a regime that um, has, in the course of the agreement that's supposed to provide us safety, has not uh, at all mitigated its um, violence in the region. In fact, they've increased um, Iranian incursions through the IRGC and the Quds Force into Iraq, into um, proxy forces with Yemen, 
into Syria are unprecedented. So while we may have gained the document, I think a very close examination of what exactly it gets us, and more importantly, what it gets the region, I think, is called for, um, and perhaps a re-examination as to whether or not, at the end of the day, it's something worth keeping uh, or worth even enforcing, frankly. But um, with, with the violence in the region basically focused from a new administration on those two points, um, I think that you will find the new administration also looking at the region less geographically, um, less from a policy standpoint. I, I suspect that some of the folk in the region who are looking for a consistent, uh, articulated, and enforceable policy, um, particularly as to Syria, um, under the previous administration will be equally disappointed under a new administration in that the approach that's been articulated so far doesn't seem to be policy-based. It doesn't seem to be one of those policy um, enshrined approaches that you can read about in uh, some of our historic approaches for foreign policy. This is pragmatism. This will be uh, a, a, almost like deal by deal, a case by case, uh, what is in the interest of the United States, which will lead to inconsistencies. I think for those who are looking for a larger framework and perhaps some confusion, uh, certainly in the beginning years as the administration deals with what will inevitably be some unforeseen challenges as it steps into the region. One of those is going to be Mosul. Um, not talked about today, but 25% uh, of the two brigades that were um, the counterterrorism brigades by Iraq are incapacitated. 30% of their equipment is either lost or turned over. Uh, Mosul, which was going to be a month-long, two-month-long endeavor, is now approaching how many months? And I don't think there's really anybody who foresees Mosul resolving itself um, anytime soon. Uh, and certainly not um, in a way that the post-Mosul uh, situation, which will be um, sorted out or not, based on Sunna and Turkmen and other minorities in the city who are hoping to survive and have their rights not infringed upon by uh, the Shia militia and others, uh, the Turks and the Kurds, uh, seeking to promote their interests. I think um, most of us believe that Mosul is going to be a real challenge, but a microcosm of the rest of the region and what is going to be the more practical um, analysis of the state of Iraq and Syria in the incoming years, which are going to be difficult a mess, messy, with very few policy options that really change the um, process um, on the ground or the prospects for peace in the short term. Um, which leads to an issue that has not come up much, um, but I think it certainly deserves mention, and that will be, I, I just said that I think geographically the administration is be looking at the Middle, Middle East in a different way, an expanded way. And part of that will come out of the next piece, which is the um, immigration, refugee, and the humanitarian and human rights issues that we have all become unacceptably accustomed to, um, which have a direct impact now on Northern Africa and Europe and are going to have grave consequences if we don't uh, come up with a solution to them, not only in post-Syria or whatever that geographic landmass looks like, but post-Iraq, but more importantly, in Northern Africa, um, and are now putting uh, other states, in particular Jordan, at severe risk. Um, they simply, we simply cannot sustain uh, the amount of uh, fighting age males and others who are dying of hunger and starvation and, um, and shame on us all for um, not speaking about it every single day with the amount of deaths and um, children and others who are dying and, and not understanding that the implications for the Gulf world, world excuse me, and the Middle East are huge because they'll come at exactly the same time that demographic statistics in Egypt, which is already suffering from economic um, problems that are, are very possibly more significant than anybody realizes, um, by 2025, we'll have uh, over 100 million, some estimate as many as 120 million Egyptians, many of whom will not have jobs, and with a similar geographic pressure put on the Kingdom of Saudi Arabia, all of which have a huge, huge impact on the region in our lifetimes.
um, and certainly in our children's lifetime and, and have direct impact on U.S. interests uh, when we speak to energy security, freedom of navigation, allies in the region, et cetera. Um, I was struck by, um, along those lines, um, what I think all of us sh believe are shared commonalities, certainly the idea uh, the new administration, I think, puts it in a slightly more brusque manner, but a concept that was brought up in the Bush administration that was promoted in the Obama administration, but that is that the U.S. simply cannot afford, either economically or um, resource-wise, to do everything at once. I, I don't ascribe to the belief that the more you do against ISIS, the more you can't do against Iran and vice versa. We simply have to do both. One's a strategic, longer-term uh, impact of a, of a very different significance than ISIS, um, and we are not in the position to, um, there's no Peter and Paul, or no, um, there's no future um, for the country's interests in, in sort of ignoring one and hoping and, and only dealing with the other. But the idea of having our allies do more, um, I think is one that you will hear uh, probably somewhat rudely, I think some people think the new president to talk about was like, hey, look, if you aren't paying your way or if you aren't contributing, um, then why should I, particularly to the extent that my interests aren't directly involved? I think the good news, and I, and I actually agree with Jake, I will say I think that there are opportunities and, and good things. I think you're going to find that the, that the Middle East and the Gulf nations in particular um, will step up and have stepped up. And um, I, in my in my belief, and I think the gentleman would agree with me, have stepped up in important ways and will continue to do so. Um, there are Gulf nations or Middle East countries, particularly uh, Jordan and Egypt, that need all of our help um, and have significant repercussions for the stability of the region going forward. They can't step up but do important things every day, particularly vis-a-vis -vis Israel. Um, with, who, that country by, um, by which will tell you openly that from a military and security standpoint has the best relationships they've very possibly ever had with both the Jordanians and the Egyptians now, and we can't afford to lose that. Um, I also, I disagree um, that the incoming president is, is um, uh, eschewing uh, United States um, democratic principles by what appear to be his fascination with strongmen. If we've learned anything, hopefully, in the last couple of decades in the Gulf and other places, it's that replacing a strong man who um, is not espousing Jeffersonian democratic principles um, has its own challenges, particularly in what comes afterwards. And usually what comes afterward are the are the those who are best organized in opposition to that particular figure who are generally the last people on the planet to promote democracy so we need to be a little more savvy and perhaps a little less naive um, certainly not abandoning our principle but being a little bit more subtle and um, savvy about how we approach them um, and then finally the role of competing powers um, i do think you're going to find um, the incoming administration messaging quite um, difficult to understand on the one hand, uh, promoting a relationship and dialogue with, um, with Russia. Uh, I w I'm a victim, or a, uh, I would say victim, but I, I, I have scars on my back from open dialogue with Russia over the third site and missile defense in Europe, um, particularly as to Poland and the Czech Republic. Uh, I have found dialogue with, um, with Foreign Minister Lavrov and the uh, Russian leadership to be exhausting and uh, not particularly rewarding when one does recognize them um, as a, a, a intermediary of similar stature. Um, just not rewarding and not very productive. Uh, we've also learned that ignoring them and letting them fill vacuums is uh, equally unrewarding. Uh, but we've got to step up. Um, and if it means working with the Russians in a very narrow sense to address to the extent they're still exists legitimate concerns regarding ISIS and extremist Islamic terrorism, then we need to do so. But only keeping in mind that that narrow, 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 narrow confluence of interests is probably grossly outweighed um, by the threats that a resurgent Russia not only represents to U.S. interests, but to U.S. interests of regional allies. And I'll, I'll stop there. Um, lots of details we could go into, but I look forward to your questions.
Well, thank you, all of you. Um, all of you have, have already touched on the, the, the basic questions I wanted to ask. So if I just restate them a little, maybe you can amplify and have crosstalk and comment on uh, what your colleagues have said and, and debate it. Um, since World War II, we've always defined one of our national interests in the region as, as um, denying uh, any opportunity for a hostile power to dominate the region. Uh, so, uh, without going into all the contradictory statements that have been made recently, um, let, me just, let me just pose it this way. Is Iran a hostile power? Is Russia a hostile power? If they are, then um, is containment necessary and sufficient? Or is it even possible that one or both of them need to be rolled back? And um, if containment or rollback is, is, is necessary, then how do you engage in engagement? What are the opportunities for engagement? Um, Michael Flynn has recently said that he believes Russia can be uh, counted on to uh, get Iran in line and to roll Iran back from supporting its uh, clients in proxy wars in the region. Can we talk about that? Because actually the Russian-Iranian working relationship in Syria, for example, has enhanced Iran's position there through enhancing Iran's client. Those are the kinds of uh, questions I'd like you to start debating. Please. Um, anyone? Derek. Uh, on you. Okay. Um, well, I guess this is less of a debating point, but it's good to respond to that and, and to pick up on some of what my colleagues talked about, and actually also to pose a question, uh, just generally. Um, first on, is Iran uh, Hostile, uh, that's what you put it, right? Hostile, adversarial, it's all the above, yes. To the United States, absolutely. Um, that's why uh, it's so important for the next administration to uh, uh, navigate this very difficult uh, dilemma that Jake has posed about uh, implementing the Iran deal, uh, but at the same time holding Iran's feet to the fire on all of the other things that it does in the region that had nothing to do with the Iran nuclear deal, whether it's conventional proliferation, support of terrorists and proxies, um, and efforts to undermine our friends in the region. Uh, and that's why we'll, we should watch very closely if the next administration will continue apace uh, to ensure that our partners and friends in the region, the Israelis, the Gulf Arab partners, uh, continue to provide them with the capabilities they need to defend themselves, to try to uh, build on this effort to, to knit those countries closer together, to build that muscle tissue of security cooperation that over the last two administrations there's been an attempt to try to develop. Uh, it's a lot of painstaking work. Uh, I, I, General Mattis is, is you know, one of the handful of people who knows this the best, so I have a lot of confidence in the Secretary of Defense along these lines, but we'll have to see uh, what kind of guidance he's going to get from the White House. Um, but at the same time, and this, this is responds a little bit to a point that Mary Beth made about the, the anxiety that was induced by uh, the President Obama's uh, uh, comment. Actually, technically, it wasn't his comments in the, in the Atlantic article about some of our partners. It was kind of the, the bank shot off the record, or background comments that Jeff Goldberg reported on that the President actually didn't say to Goldberg, but others attributed uh, to the President about our Gulf Arab partners, but also about Iran in the region, where obviously it's a fact that Iran is a factor in the region. It's going to remain you know, a, a player in the region, and our Gulf Arab partners, many of whom interact with Iran a lot compared to the United States. So trying to, at the same time, build up our partners, make sure they're more capable to defend themselves, encourage them to cooperate more together with themselves and with us, uh, and at the same time try to bring together some, uh, or encourage to the extent we can, some discussion between our Gulf partners and Iran. I mean, that's something I think the U.S. can't inf insert itself into, but it's fully appropriate for the United States working with our Gulf 
allies to encourage that kind of conversation. But I think most of the movement's got to occur on the Iranian side, to be honest, right? I mean, this is, they are the agitator uh, uh, of much of the ills of the region at the moment. Uh, so I don't, I don't see this as a, a kind of containment, um, uh, containment or appeasement scenario. We've got to stay tough to what we're doing directly, be there for our partners, um, and at the same time, try to find a way to bring about the sorts of changes inside Iran that we want to see that we think over time will moderate their behavior. Now to Russia, and this is more of my question, is, is uh, Russia's goals in, in Europe are very clear to me, right? Divide the U.S. from Europe, uh, undermine the European Union project, uh, you know, make NATO weaker, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. In the Middle East, it seems to me its goal is really just to maintain the status quo which is not a particularly advantageous position for Russia in terms of the status quo. I mean, it's got very few friends in the region. What it's been doing in Syria brutally uh, and, and uh, uh, in a way that I think over time does great damage to Russia, but it's, it's basically taking a big risk to maintain what it currently has, which is a military position in Syria and a long-standing, decades-long ally in Syria. But I don't know what Russia's broader goals are. I mean, I think, sure, they'd love it if all of a sudden our Gulf partners would buy their military equipment, not ours. I just don't see that in the cards. I don't think that our, our Gulf allies particularly want Russian equipment. Um, so, you know, when it comes to this question of, of is Russia filling a vacuum left by the United States, are they surging in the region, I haven't seen much evidence to suggest that beyond trying to protect what they've got in Syria, they have much ambition. But maybe I'm missing something. Um, I'll respond to that, and I, I would love to hear what Dimitri says, actually. Um, I'm sure he's much more well-informed. But, but um, I guess if you boil it down to a practical issue, um, Russia maintaining and expanding its presence in Syria, um, its protection of its fleet, uh, its expanding its air capabilities and dual use of an Iranian airfield is important, but, but it underestimates what's really going on, I believe. And this is a prestige issue. This is a Russia inserting itself into the Middle East, which was clearly where the US was dominant issue. This is Russia hosting peace negotiations without the US being invited. Um, this is about high level strategic signaling. Um, this is about everybody in Europe by the way, the U.S. couldn't even get invited to the meeting on Russia, um, Turkey, and Syria, and our own. So what do you think they're going to do, Baltic states? Oh, by the way, you non-payers in NATO, you are on notice. Russia, a.k.a. the resurgent near-far USSR, is back on the battlefield in a global way. And oh, by the way, stay tuned for Libya where we will get a little bit of a presence and we'll help out just a little to stare the bejesus out of all of you regarding what we're gonna do with our presence in the Med. So this, this, is, about, this is about chess um, and we're looking at it in checkers and I think the symbolism of what's going on here is hugely significant. Sure. I think that if we uh, uh, want to have an objective evaluation of whether Russia is uh, an enemy, we have to decide first what are our interests, because how we define our interests uh, will obviously have an impact on uh, what Russia means for us. Now, if we believe uh, that we will uh, proceed with further NATO expansion, uh, perhaps inviting uh, Ukraine and Georgia to join NATO, if we believe that our priority is to remove Russian control over Crimea and that we would not allow uh, any deal on the rest of Ukraine which would give uh, Putin even a perception uh, of success because we would not uh, want to reward uh, Russian aggression. If we feel uh, that Russia does not belong to the Middle East and clearly the objective in the Middle East is first and foremost to checkmate the United States and to create trouble. Now, if this is our definition of uh, uh, American interests and our view of Russian conduct, 
then of course you're absolutely right. I of course think that one uh, significance of uh, Trump's election is that he have suggested a different definition okay. uh, of American interests. Okay. American interests uh, are defined more narrowly, uh, less in terms of the United States being a global government, a global uh, uh, policeman, uh, but uh, a superpower which can do a lot of things, as you have said, at the same time. Uh, you, you don't have to say that if, uh, if we are dealing with Russia, then we have to sacrifice Baltic states. Certainly far from that, we can do a lot of things simultaneously. But we also are not, according to Trump, uh, a de facto world government. And that there are certain issues which are paramount to American security and prosperity. There are other issues which are just important. And there are some issues which are fairly peripheral. And if you, for instance, uh, believe that uh, we have to protect Baltic states, as I do, because rightly or wrongly, we invited them to join NATO, and they are NATO members. And we made a commitment. It's a question of our legitimacy. It's a question of our ability to work with other European allies. We should deliver on our obligations. But I am not aware of any reason why we should encourage Ukraine and Georgia to join NATO. And I am not aware of any reason why uh, we cannot try to negotiate at least a deal with Moscow and Ukraine, which would reestablish uh, uh, Kyiv's control over the rest of Ukraine, with an exception of uh, uh, Crimea. Uh, but uh, in response, there would be a modicum of federalization of Ukraine. Uh, and uh, I think that there would be some kind of commitment, and diplomats, I'm sure, uh, can decide how to present this commitment that Ukraine and Georgia in the near future would not join NATO. I think it's worth trying. In the case of Syria, Russia is not a superpower. Uh, I don't think that Putin went to Syria as a result of long-term strategic calculation. They went there because Assad was losing. They uh, went there because uh, Putin, I don't know how may, may, many of you remember, uh, he promised that after taking over Crimea, there would be so-called Novorossia. Russia would move further west in Ukraine and would be allegedly greeted by uh, local population Swiss legs, what never happened. Uh, economic sanctions, decline in all prices. Putin uh, feels squeezed at home. Yeah. And he could not afford another humiliation, another defeat in Syria. I think that uh, we can talk to Russia uh, about a deal in Syria which would address what you have said. Uh, namely, that they would not be doing things unilaterally or with the Iranians without the United States. I hope that uh, President Trump will tell Putin privately, confidentially, without embarrassing Putin, but would tell Putin, Vladimir, we now will have a different ball game. We will not try to mess inside your country, uh, even if we disagree with the way you govern. But you need to understand, we will have real red lines. And one of them is on Syria. You will not be able to impose a unilateral solution without the United States. And the United States has the means and the term determination not to allow this to happen. I would not tell you all the details, but believe me, the United States will not allow this to happen. So let's talk about a formula which would be acceptable to both of us and which would lead to Syria staying a one country, perhaps obviously a confederation. And let's look for a way for Mr. Assad, if not to leave power soon, but at least his job being significantly, let's say, renegotiated, reduced, and etc. I see no reason why we shouldn't try that. Uh, I'm not talking about any advances to Moscow. I'm not talking about any unilateral concessions. I'm not talking about abandoning any allies. And let me make one final point. Some of our toughest allies uh, seem to be able to deal with Moscow quite uh, effectively. Certainly Israel, they have a very good relationship with Moscow. They don't agree on a lot of things. Uh, I don't think that uh, the Egyptians are particularly in love with Russia, uh, but they seem to have a good working relationship. And the same is true of Japan. They have an understandable de disagreement over uh, the Northern Ireland, Northern Territories. But on many issues, uh, 
they seem to be able to work together. You don't need to have a benign view of Russia to think that sometimes you can have working arrangements with adversaries. And then you see whether these working arrangements uh, would be transactional or would lead to something more. Good point. Yeah, so a um, couple thoughts on this. I, I, I'm quite surprised by the degree to which I completely agree with Dimitri. But it, that is not, in my view, at all the way in which the incoming president or his team have talked about Syria. That sounds a lot more like the way that Hillary Clinton talked about Syria, which was to say, ultimately, there is only a diplomatic solution that has to take into account Russia's interests, but has to put on the table the possibility that the United States will u exert its own power if there's an effort at the imposition of a unilateral solution. That is actually calling for the U.S. to put cards on the table, which potentially get us militarily engaged in Syria. Because you can't, it's not enough, as we learned from the past few years, to simply go to the Russians and say, we want to cut a deal. If Putin doesn't believe that the U.S. is going to do something more active, he's not going to cut the deal. We've seen that. And, and, I'm, and I'm somewhat skeptical, based on what we've seen so far, that that kind of conversation, as you just described, is likely to take place. But perhaps it will. The other thing that I was struck by is in, your, in, in Dimitri's opening comments, he described, I think, a fundamentally adversarial relationship between the United States and Russia. How else could one account for the possibility that if we don't do what Russia wants or if we cross Russia's red lines, they could weaponize terrorism against us? That, in effect, is defining an adversarial relationship. Now, of course, you can deal with an adversary in a way in which you come to certain mutual understandings. But if there is a kind of gun-to-the-head quality to the dynamic, uh, we'll hack your election, we'll fund terrorists against you, we'll take other steps to try to undermine you and your allies unless you respect and acknowledge our interests in a certain way, then yes, I think it's only fair to describe that as a basically adversarial dynamic. And I think where, where if you start from that clear-eyed proposition and then say, well, nonetheless, as a matter of practicality and principle, the United States has to deal with Russia and has to try to come to some understanding, uh, then I think we're effectively on the same page. The Iran question is fascinating to me because I have not yet heard a convincing account of how you come to a deal with Russia that excludes Iran's interests. If such a deal exists, that would be great. But my basic concern about an outcome in, in uh, Syria that's acceptable to Russia is that it's overwhelmingly likely to also be acceptable to Iran as well, which means that Iran maintains a forward-based capacity both directly and through the proxy of Hezbollah in Syria and, and in Lebanon. And uh, I think that is adverse to our interests. And I certainly don't want my opening comments to be interpreted as saying we have to choose between ISIS and Iran. It's rather that if our strategy for dealing with ISIS is essentially signing up with the Russian playbook on ISIS, we are in effect empowering Iran. Or at least it seems to me that that is the logical conclusion of a policy that goes down that track. Uh, so. Were there to be an opportunity to divide Russia and Iran and come to a deal with Russia that begins to push back on Iran's regional ambitions, I think that would be obviously as a logical matter the best way to proceed. Whether as a practical matter it's possible, I have my doubts. Okay. Um, the, the first thought I have is, is that um, you know, Derek, yes, we, we have provided uh, extensive security support to our traditional Gulf Arab allies. And that is a deterrent against certainly conventional Iranian aggression against them, but it, it wasn't enough to change the situation in Syria. Um, although we did intervene there in, in, in more ways than are normally uh, known or talked about. Um, so, is it too late for us to do something new that changes the dynamics in Syria? Because we have 
we have also defined as one of our national interests the, the protection of friends and allies in the region so that we can have access to sea lanes and air corridors and resources and everything else. They view Iran's presence in Syria and the, the Shia Crescent as an existential threat. And um, the Russian involvement in Syria before they got around to uh, attacking ISIS involved, uh, I don't know if decimating is the right word, but severely weakening the, the, the rebel forces that were being supported by the United States, the Saudis, the Qataris, the Turks, changing the situation on the ground to such an extent that how is it that we talk to Russia about getting anything that is um, satisfactory to us in a, in, a, in a diplomatic solution for Syria? Anybody? Anybody? Uh, let me say first that we have to realize where we are now in terms of the military situation in Syria. Uh, I uh, was actually struck by uh, uh, an event we had at our center several uh, weeks ago uh, with three leading generals, all of them active duty, all of them involved in planning operations in that region. Uh, it was obviously unclassified, but it was off the record, so I cannot name the people. But what struck me was a consensus among the three generals that as long as Russia is in Syria and have capabilities which they have now, particularly uh, air defenses, that we do not have a credible military option in Syria, short, of course, uh, of risking an all-out confrontation with Russia. And I trust to try to press the generals, asking uh, exactly about the kind of a conversation between uh, Mr. Trump and Mr. Putin, mm -hmm. uh, where uh, he would tell Putin uh, that uh, it's a new era in the different ball game, and friend Vladimir, you better take me seriously. There was a consensus among the generals that it is too late for that, uh, that Putin would not be impressed by words alone, that the only thing that can change the dynamic uh, would be clearly some great American presence uh, in the region, and perhaps doing something on the ground, somewhere, somehow, uh, at the right point, teaching uh, Putin a lesson with blood and iron. And uh, I think that the Russians give us plenty of opportunities to demonstrate our resolve without creating an artificial confrontation. At the same time, again, let me repeat, if you don't have a credible military solution, let me quote that great humanitarian Marcus Aurelius, uh, who, when he had a, a rebellious Roman commander uh, trying uh, to remove him from power, uh, Aurelius at first asked, uh, do we have the legions to crush him? And the response was, the legions are in Spain, you have to wait. Can we poison him? And the answer was no, he has uh, foolproof security. And then Aurelius said, well, then let's try diplomacy. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and I think out of necessity, we have to try diplomacy with Russia, coupled with genuine resolve and uh, military movements, including, if necessary, military moves, which would demonstrate to Putin our seriousness this time. Mm -hmm. Which military moves? Well, I think that it, it, we should make uh, very clear uh, that uh, we will do what is necessary to support uh, Syrian opposition and that we will uh, simply not allow Russia to win militarily and that we will provide uh, in a responsible and limited way anti-aircraft uh, uh, weapons which would make this operation in the long run very costly to Moscow. I think that we also have uh, start talking to the Turks and to the Egyptians who are very central to their situation and to make whatever effort we can make to remove Turkey at least from that uh, semi-alliance with Moscow, which is central for any hope Russia has uh, to impose unilateral solution, I mean solution without the United States uh, on Syria. And my impression is that Erdogan has serious issues with the United States, but he has serious issues with Russia. And I think a, a meaningful outreach to Erdogan can make a difference. Uh, the more the Egyptians deal with the Russians, uh, 
the more people in the Egyptian leadership are here, have the, uh, how to put it, their level of uh, irritation is growing. Mm -hmm. uh, and I think it would be perfectly appro appro appropriate again for a new administration to try a, a new approach to Egypt. And they do understand that we don't want to count on strong men, uh, that this is inherently unstable. But I think uh, uh, it, uh, it doesn't mean that when uh, you have leaders whom we did not put in power, who really are genuine local leaders, then uh, uh, not some kind of uh, little midgets whom we are artificially supporting in positions of power, that we should be prepared to work with them, recognizing their practical legitimacy and trying to make deals uh, in this instance against Russian influence. Mm -hmm. Someone from the audience asked you, Dmitry, if. Uh, you know, he quoted Rex Tillerson today saying the U.S. needs to engage its traditional allies, including Turkey's Erdogan. But Tillerson also said the newest administration should recommit to the Syrian Kurds. Um, can we do both? I don't know. Again, you have three experts uh, on, on the region, much better experts than me, but it brings me to one point. I do not know whether you can see everything at once, but I think that we have to do, have to learn to do something very uh, an American, at least an American since our victory in the Cold War. We have to understand that we have to start defining priorities, not just rhetorically, but in terms of making some hard decisions. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Can I just comment uh, briefly on that, because it points up one of the early choices that the next administration is going to have to make when it comes to uh, one of the the, the big opportunity, so to speak, in the campaign, counter ISIL campaign, which is what to do about Raqqa. Uh, and it's a timing question, and it involves the Kurds. If, if, the, if the, there's a judgment that it's in our interest to take Raqqa sooner rather than later, it's going to require relying on the Kurds, who are the most capable of doing that uh, on our behalf with our support. And it will also require providing uh, the Syrian Kurds with the kinds of capabilities that would make Erdogan very unhappy. And he's made that very clear to the United States. So we can wait, meaning we can take the time to build up uh, Arab tribes, which uh, our special operators are, are working on doing uh, right now in Syria, but that's going to take some time. So uh, it's, a, it's a tactical issue. Uh, that would be, will be a significant blow to ISIS when it occurs, meaning the retaking of Raqqa, but if we choose to do this sooner rather than later, and there's an argument that we would want to do this sooner, it's going to create a lot of tension with Erdogan that this administration has not figured out how to, how to navigate, and it's going to be a, uh, it's unclear to me how the next administration will figure out how to navigate, particularly if the president-elect's coming into a posture that is going to be more forgiving of some of Erdogan's uh, more authoritarian impulses. Were you trying to say something earlier? No, I actually agree that the Kurds are very likely. It's uncooperative. It's or obviously Russian. Right. <laughs> <laughs> um, that the Kurds were very likely going to be um, both from a Iraq standpoint as well as from a serious standpoint the one leverage um, point that haven't hasn't been fully explored um, and there are significant repercussions on our relationship with turkey but there are things that turkey wants out of us long and short term that we have not been creative about and i do think that dimitri and, and others have hinted at us acting uh, very differently than we have in the past perhaps more pragmatically perhaps more uh, less uh, diplomatically on certain fronts, but um, you know, talks on Syria have led us into, you know, again, I can't say it enough. At a minimum, you know, we talk about it as this uh, post Cold War strategy between Russia and the United States, of course, and ISIS, which is a legitimate threat to both, and Assad, who is becoming less and less consequential, certainly to the extent that he's not supported by Russia. But at the end of the day, there are um, a historically large number of dying refugees and displaced persons with literally a generational impact. And um, it's, it's the problem that's going to keep on giving 
uh, even as we resolve these other diplomatic solutions, and yet we don't seem to want to talk about that openly. Right. Well, uh, there are quite a few questions here, quite a few questions here about the Arab-Israeli conflict and peace process. Um, but there, there, <laughs> but I, there's one other area I want to go into before we get there, and that is um, but it, o Obama <coughs> said at West Point two years ago that um, terrorism was the most direct threat from the region, and uh, he emphasized a counterterrorism strategy that relied upon cooperation with our security partners in the region. Um, I'd like to ask a few questions about that. First, when we've talked about the myth, who, who talked about the myth of disengagement? Was it Derek or Jake? Okay, we talk about the myth of disengagement, particularly people are talking about us not using enough military assets. But actually we have, quite a few. How much of our success would you attribute to, against ISIS and Al-Qaeda would you attribute to that? Um, then we have the whole question of the participation of our traditional partners in the region. Uh, sometimes they're criticized for actually facilitating this. But how much have they contributed to the battle against this? And um, now we come to Mary Beth. I mean, really, if you have, um, if our policy in Syria and our, our mistakes in Syria and the region have contributed to this refugee and this humanitarian situation that can radicalize people and produce more extremism and threaten our partners in the region, then uh, what do we need to do to correct that in terms of the fight against terrorism? And finally, I will come to Arab-Israeli just to touch on it. Um, if there is a plan to defeat ISIS quickly, does moving the embassy to Jerusalem help? <laughs> so I think, uh, first I'll start with, with what the, this question of the military campaign against ISIL and what, what the U.S. has been able to accomplish. Um, clearly, the, the, there's, there's two dimensions. There's U.S. direct action, which uh, the U.S. and uh, several European coalition partners have been uh, conducting every day over the skies of Iraq and Syria. I think at last account, over 16,000 airstrikes since uh, September of 2014. If you believe our military leaders, nearly 50,000 ISIL fighters killed. I mean, even if you cut that in inflation by half, that's, say, 25,000 ISIL fighters killed. That's not U.S. military disengagement from the problems of Iraq and Syria. But there's only so much U.S. direct action can do. It's got to be combined with our partners on the ground. Uh, and, and so I think there's a lot of confidence from our military leaders that when it comes to the counter-ISIL campaign, we will achieve military success. But the question is, what comes next? Uh, in many ways, the, the greatest mistake ISIL made uh, was uh, the S in ISIL, was state. Because if the United States military has shown anything over the last 15 years, is it can take down states. Right? It, can dry, it can destroy finances, it can kill a lot of fighters, take down their leadership structure, take away their capabilities. But the, so the question for, our, for us moving forward, and this gets to a point Jake made about kind of if we play this out several steps, um, not wanting to kind of repeat the same cycle over and over, is when ISIL ceases to become a state or it becomes basically dismantled, uh, but then becomes an insurgency. And then we see just as IQ, AQI morphed into ISIL, then we morph into the, 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 the third iteration of this and onward. And this then gets to the, the question of, of local partners. And, and it, in many ways, it's, it, it's, the, it's the key to this problem, but it's also the Achilles heel of the strategy. Because one thing I think we've learned through two administrations now, uh, with uh, a lot of US resources and, and effort put into trying to build partner capacity, to use the, the Pentagon phrase, is how difficult this is how imperfect it is, and how, in some cases, very unreliable those partners are over time. And we all, there's always a lot of talk about, you know, we'll create the 
Sunni Arab army to come in and take out Assad. You know, it won't be U.S. forces who have to do it. It will be our Sunni partners, which will create the safe zone in Syria or defend the safe zone in Syria. We'll just create the forces. Well, having been humbled several times on the, by U.S.-led efforts to try to build capable forces, uh, whether it's in Iraq or Libya or Syria or Afghanistan, uh, where we've had some success, it never turns out the way we would we would like it to. So. Um, that's not to say we shouldn't try. We should just uh, have our expectations in check about how difficult that is, how long it's going to take, and that that's not going to be a quick solution to any of our problems. And very briefly on the question of the move to Jerusalem, I, as I mentioned in my, my opening remarks, I think that's kind of a disruptive uh, action. It's unclear to me how that uh, uh, enhances uh, our ability to either bring the Israelis and Palestinians closer together or take advantage of, uh, as Jake noted, this, this notable strategic convergence we've seen develop over the last several years between Israel and um, uh, our Sunni uh, partners in particular. In fact, it could put an issue on the table that, that unnecessarily uh, uh, undermines that strategic convergence that, that we've been watching develop largely without us. I mean, it's been happening kind of on its own. Sorry, when I think about the, the ISIS challenge, I see three major driving factors towards the growth of organized uh, radical jihadist organizations across the Middle East and North Africa. The first is um, the collapsing state structures or the weakening of state structures that have created oxygen for these groups and more capacity for them to engage and grow. Part of that is the result of U.S. action, obviously the Iraq War being the most dramatic example of that, but part of that also is um, indigenous disaffection with leaders who lost legitimacy in places like Egypt um, and Mubarak. That's one. Two, the growing strain of vir virulent uh, extremism, Salafism within uh, Islam that has been bastardized, as, as Mary Beth said, uh, and weaponized into something um, uh, it, it, uh, sort of bordering on nihilism and barbarism. Um, and then it, that has been compounded by the capacity of technology to disseminate that view. Uh, and yes, I do think that money coming from parts of the Middle East and the Gulf has had a lot to do over the last 30 years with, with helping spread that as well. And then the third is a proxy conflict between Iran and the Sunni states that is further fueling the instability uh, and the conditions under which groups like ISIS, uh, Ansar bin Maktis, Ansar al-Sharia, you name it across the region, have been able to take advantage of um, uh, uh, of this, this ongoing battle. What can the United States do about these three things? What, when you think about U.S. policy, it seems to me that military action can treat symptoms but not ultimately causes and has done quite a good job of that, uh, taking leaders off the battlefield, reducing force projection capabilities of terrorist groups and the like, but not fundamentally settling the question of what we're going to do long term about this issue. How good are we at stitching together state structures and making sure there's strong, legitimate, stable leaders across the Middle East and North Africa, without going into great detail, I would say not very good. How good are we at winning the war, which Mary Beth alluded to, uh, of the moderates against the extremists within Islam? I'm not sure the United States is particularly well positioned to do that, although there may be some things. Are there steps that we can take to reduce the level of proxy conflict between Iran and our Sunni partners to deal with that aspect and thereby create the greater possibility for those other two drivers of the terrorist threat to be dealt with. I think that is where we've got to put our efforts. And for that, it is going to require increasing the confidence of our Sunni partners and denting the confidence of Iran that it can use its particular mix of tactics in Lebanon and Syria, in Iraq, in Yemen, in Bahrain uh, to achieve its ends. Both of those require greater American engagement in the Middle East. And here lies another contradiction that the new administration is going to face. 
America First is going to run headlong into the possibility that everything that Mary Beth laid out in terms of her expectations of what's going to happen are actually going to involve more U.S. commitment and involvement in the Middle East than perhaps we've seen to date, which I don't know is going to sit particularly well with people who hear America First and think that means we're letting other people, including the Russians, deal with it. But fundamentally, from my perspective, we have to find, it's not, we're not, you can't engineer Iran's removal from the region. It exists in the region. What you have to engineer is a modus vivendi that is on terms that are favorable to the United States and our partners, and that is going to require more U.S. engagement in the region. On the Arab-Israeli question and the moving of the embassy, that is a very risky proposition for the continued capacity. Leave aside whether this strategic convergence will ever help you solve the peace process. Maybe the answer to that question is no. I don't know. We certainly know that it's helping Israel and it is in the United States' interest with respect to the terrorist threat. The terrorist threat in Sinai, the terrorist threat in Jordan, and the terrorist threat across the region. And the idea that you would put that at risk by choosing to make a diplomatic move of this kind, which I don't know materially advances anyone's strategic interests at this point, that seems um, like not a particularly prudent step to take in the near term. Other comments? Any other comments? Go ahead, Dimitri. Thank you. Um, I agree with a lot of what I heard. Um, just like a couple of comments, and you asked me about the human rights, um, which I, I hit upon mostly because it hasn't come up in other contexts, and I, I do think it's important. And I'll put that in context in just a moment. I, I, I agree with my colleagues. Um, you know, today we're talking a lot about ISIS. Um, inshallah, we won't be talking about a resurgence al-Qaeda um, in another six months, but I, I worry that that will be the next step. Um, and then it will be the Shia militia that were empowered by Iran and Iran's proxies that have a quasi-independent uh, survival mechanism in Iraq, um, and yada, yada, yada. And as Jake appropriately said, you know, the increasing weaponization and the increasing technology that are available um, to these non-state actors are, are just going to mean that the, I believe the Middle East is going to remain a mess for the foreseeable future. I mean, let's just get on board with that concept and that our, that our policy and our activities at best will play around the margins and better them hopefully for U.S. interests, but that significant long-term changes will be elusive and take a lot of time and effort. I, I do think, I can agree with the underlying statement that we didn't increase, um, decrease and significantly depart the region. I believe we did. I believe the perception that we did is accurate and we can quibble uh, about that, but I, I do think that part of it is um, not creating new vacuums, certainly, and attempting to refill holes that we left um, in place for the last year, and even perceptual holes, you know, calling you know, ISIS a JV team, uh, withdrawing the troops from Iraq the way they were withdrawn certainly didn't help the situation. But we are where we are, which leads to my most important point is, and it leads to your question regarding moving the embassy to Israel. You know, I would hope that this incoming administration will be the exception to the rule, but every incoming administration that I'm aware of gets tested early on. And they get tested by the known adversaries and they get tested by the guys who they, they um, are worried that they don't have to deal with and that creep out from underneath rocks. And I think we will be tested and hopefully we won't be tested on our own shores. And the one thing that the administration over the last 10 years, or certainly eight years has done, has kept us all safe in our homes, which is no insignificant achievement. It's just phenomenal that we haven't had another uh, terrorist incident and, and our government has kept us safe. And I, I worry that that is the home run for a resurgent Al-Qaeda or an ISIS that wants to reassert itself that everyone's looking for. Um, and certainly we haven't heard from North Korea and I predict that we will very soon because nobody likes um, not being mentioned early and often more than the North Koreans. Uh, so we'll have a missile launch or something very quickly. And I would hope that moves like moving the embassy to Jerusalem, which is maybe not on the high priority must-do list, 
we'll slide to the G when we get around to it list. And perhaps that there'll be consideration for, you know, there are fights I want to pick and fights I have to, fights I have to fight. And maybe that falls into the, eh, maybe that's not a, a controversy I want to add to my plate just now category. Um, it's not my decision. I would not have made it. But um, I, I think reality being what it is, hopefully it'll slide. And, and then the final thing on the humanitarian issue. Look, I, have, I grew up in CIA. I'm a lawyer, and I worked at DOD in, in this. I am not the person that ever signed up for Greenpeace or any humanitarian or human rights or refugee organization um, in the world. But I'm the one who's sitting here pounding that issue. Um, a, because it's an American issue, and it's deeply embedded in our principle. But from a pragmatic standpoint, and it gets to something Jake and, and, and my colleagues have alluded to, we haven't even begun to think about addressing the reasons why ISIS and Al-Qaeda and Jabhat al-Nusra and all these organizations are popping up. And yes, some of it's the Sunni-Shia conflict, and some of it's um, you know, old, old grievances that are tribally based or regionally based, but some of it is underlying grievances that have a lot to do with jobs and access to information and access to power. And yes, you can argue that a lot of the best known terrorists are well educated and come from good families, I get that. But there's underlying issues here that we have not addressed. And whether it's, it's, it's Islam that needs to address it, or this is the great reformation between Islam and, and within Islam, I don't know. But we've got to get to it, because when you look at the economy of the West and the economies of the US in particular, and the way money is moving in the world, and you look at the proliferation of weapons, and you look at the way things are communicated, and then you look at the demographic realities, time is running out. And this is a huge, huge pool of natural recruitment and individuals who have grievances who will be exploited by our enemies if we don't get there first. Could I make a very brief Please. comment about Jerusalem? I think that I completely agree with all my colleagues, and I understand that it is a difficult issue and potentially a very damaging issue for the United States. Do you need to understand also why Mr. Trump has said and has done uh, uh, what she said and done? It's very clear that he had a special relationship with Netanyahu for some time and that Netanyahu was uh, cultivating him at the time when many other leaders were kind of uh, treating him as a pariah. It was not unimportant, to put it delicately, <coughs> for Mr. Trump that Netanyahu provided him with some legitimacy. It's also clear that uh, both Mr. Trump and people close to him have a genuine sympathy and indeed, I would say, commitment to Israel and the kind of an idea that the Israelis are entitled to select uh, their own capital has a genuine emotional appeal to these people. Then, I think that uh, uh, there is a question which I, it's dangerous to, to say what I will say because a lot of people would want to always simplify it and to bring it to a logical extreme. Uh, Ms. Trump uh, needs to build a constituency which would allow him to do a lot of heavy lifting uh, domestically and internationally. It's very important to him if he wants to do a lot of things uh, during his first months in office as he is clearly uh, hopeful that he would be able to do. Under those circumstances, it is this kind of an emotional issue, sending a very clear message, can be quite helpful with an important constituency. I don't mean, I don't mean uh, that you are talking about a cynical uh, presentation of youth he does not have. I am simply trying to explain calculations of people around Mr. Trump the way I see them. And then, of course, Mr. Trump is genuinely committed to a wall with Mexico and uh, to Mexico paying for that. But then we just have discovered it is a question of sequence. <laughs> and, uh, and my hope and expectation is that we will be able to wait till the Mexicans pay for the wall. <laughs> well, <laughs> Well, I, um, thank you. I have talked about American national interests um, 
denying the region to hostile powers, supporting friends and allies, access to resources and, and uh, air and sea carters. But uh, there's another national interest that we're starting to talk about here without really defining it. And it's uh, an ideological national interest. It's support for self-determination, popular participation in government, human rights. So um, where does that, where would that have stood in a Clinton administration? Where is it going to stand in a Trump administration? And um, let's touch on two issues uh, that are specific. Um, we've been talking about moving the embassy. Well, what about signals that we give that uh, suggest support for more Israeli settlements in the West Bank, which can foreclose the possibility of a two-state solution? We acquiesce in that or we support that. What, is our, what does that do to our, our credibility as a country that has ideological, these ideological national interests? Number two, coming to something Mary Beth talked about, um, when you look at our traditional partners in the region in the Gulf, um, and we refer to them as authoritarian and uh, are critical of their domestic uh, governance, um, do we think about the progress they've made in the recent decades uh, to reform, and do we give sufficient attention to Mary Beth, what would come after them if um, they weren't supported and they were to um, be in jeopardy? Actually, um, a woman, a Saudi woman, uh, said to me once, um, I hope that we never get one person, one vote here, because if we do, I'm going to lose all my rights. In other words, the government is much more reformist than the population and is determining the pace, the, the, the possible pace of reform there. So we're talking about Arab-Israeli conflict and we're talking about our relationship with Gulf Arabs in light of our ideological interests. Can we talk about that? You know, Having grappled with these incredibly difficult questions, along with Derek at the height of the Arab <clears throat> revolutions, and say there's no easy answer to this, and the problem is that we tend to divide this into a short-term, long-term construct, where we say, well, in the short term, we've really just got to support the guys that are there, because what comes next is worse, and also we need their help to do certain things. But in the long term, we'll work to try to create the conditions under which what this Saudi woman said to you doesn't persist or doesn't obtain, where actually you begin to inculcate reforms to the point where you could produce a more legitimate, pluralistic, a representative government. And the problem with U.S. policy based on that proposition is that the short term always completely blots out the sun for the long term. And we just sort of end up living in this circumstance where we're moving, you know, we're essentially shoring up leaders who in some cases get increasingly um, illegitimate within their own countries. And then the bottom can fall out, as has done before, and has could easily do again, and I think we'd be foolish to think otherwise. On the other hand, if you move to a strictly long-term proposition and say, well, let's just wipe the slate clean and throw all these guys out and, you know, have hell for the next 30 years, but in the long term, it's all going to work. If you purely privilege the long term, you're in a real problem, too. So, it seems to me that we have to find a way to recognize this challenge to U.S. policymaking that has bedeviled both Republican and Democratic administrations, be honest about it, and say, okay, well, what can we do to better strike this balance as we go forward? And what does it mean to actually have a country on a path to reform and support it along that path? I mean, I look at a country like the UAE, which I do think has made some incredible strides forward in terms of generating greater legitimacy and opportunity for its people. But I look at other places and see very near-term challenges. I mean, Egypt right now, um, even if you ask the Israelis, they will say, uh, 
in the next year or two, we could see an economic crisis in Egypt that would be incredibly profound and destabilizing. And the, the jihadist threat coming out of Egypt today, right now, is significant. So how do we properly, taking each country as its own case, figure out a way to navigate this dilemma? It would be great if we could come up with a better answer to that question. I have my profound doubts about whether the incoming administration, which seems to be mostly focused on supporting and shoring up the strongman, um, is really going to be grappling with that in a full way. But I think if we don't keep a basic concept that we've got to be working towards a fixed star of representative government, legitimate, accountable government, self-determination and pluralism in the future, um, then we're not just undermining our values, we're undermining our long-term interests in the region, and we will just be putting out fires constantly. Mm -hmm. uh, look, I, I, I completely agree with what, with what Jake has said, and I think that you know, if you think back, the Obama administration came into office believing that the Bush administration uh, had perhaps overdone it with the, with the quote-unquote democracy agenda uh, in the region, and that there that despite the, the good intentions uh, that had been unsuccessful, and as I noted in my opening remarks, that attempted a reset with the Muslim world that in itself was, was unsuccessful, or at least did not meet the high expectations that many had placed upon it. Um, you know, this is gonna be an enduring dilemma, this kind of, this, this trade-off both temporally between short-term, long-term, but also the, the trade-off between our values and what is our our core our, our core security interests. That said, I think that it, I mean the UAE is a good example. I think there are there are trends in the region that are positive. I mean certainly Emirates stands out. I, I would also argue that that Saudi Arabia, with some of the reforms that uh, Mohammed bin Salman has been instituting, are are although there's a lot of questions early on, are headed in the right direction. And as Mary Beth knows far better than than I do, this has been something that. The Emirates, in particular, have been very uh, uh, kind of um, involved in, in terms of trying to help uh, their Saudi friends navigate. Supportive. Right, it's supportive, and and because they've they kind of went through this 15 years ago. Right. Um, uh, that said, if you think of sort of black swans of of what the new administration could face, I mean, um, if you think of three three. Uh, three leaders in the region that are gonna matter greatly, the, the future will matter greatly to the United States' interests, to Israel's interests, others, uh, Abu Mazen and the Palestinian Authority, uh, uh, King Salman in, in Saudi, and the Supreme Leader in Iran, I think the youngest of those three is 79. So, and, and in all three cases, there are leadership transitions that are not quite clear. Uh, and so we could see a contesting for what the future holds. Um, the actual, actual aerial table suggests that those are transitions we could see happening in the, in the course of this administration, perhaps all in the same year, which would be one of those challenges that, will, that would be uh, significant for any, any government. Um, and then just quickly on the settlements question, I mean, I see it as less of an ideological question for the United States as more of a pragmatic one. I mean, I think, and the answer, or the question that Secretary Kerry has been asking as he's leaving office is this question of how can you reconcile the two-state solution Right. with the demographic reality that we are seeing uh, uh, on the Palestinian side. And if we believe in an Israel uh, as a Jewish democratic state, it's hard to see that as it continues to uh, grow, expand its territorial footprint uh, in Palestinian territories. And I've yet to see a compelling answer for how you can solve that dilemma uh, uh, from anyone who who's supports the expansion of settlements, which suggests to me we're headed to a one-state solution scenario. No. No. Well, that, that's a question of, is, of, of what future Israel will be, and whether it will be a democratic state or a Jewish state. But there's also the question of whether Palestinians <laughs> have any hope for human rights and self-determination under the current circumstances. Any other comments? My only comment would be, um, I do think, and I'm, again, I'm not here to speak or anticipate what the incoming administration is, but I do think, I, I think both gentlemen have alluded to it, that, that originally it'll be a much more pragmatic approach. 
Um, and you know, all of these individuals um, are good people and know what our foundational principles are regarding democracy and human rights, and I'm sure they won't be neglected. I think um, probably what we'll see is the primary functions of government from a foreign policy standpoint will be the promotion of American interest abroad, um, with only a secondary standpoint being um, export of a particular idea or government structure. I do think one of the things that hopefully we have learned is while democracy and our ideas of the role of the individual in the decision making around him um, are, are derived of a deep tradition of uh, basically Anglo-Saxon, Judeo-Christian. Uh, there's certainly been lots of minorities in the American tradition, but, but that has been primarily the focus. And that's just not the case in other places in the world. And democracy doesn't exist unless you have judicial systems and unless you have people who want and understand democracy the way we do. Um, I have many friends who frankly say, I can go to see the crown prince in, in my country as he's having lunch at the grocery store and ask him for something, or I can go to his, um, to his meeting once a week and ask for something, when do you get to go see the president? And, and at the end of the day, that's the kind of democracy that I accept. And frankly, you know, there's an argument for that. Um, and on the, on the settlements, I'm going to demur, but I do think that any policy of the United States that promotes continued a violation of any country's own laws, whether it comes to property rights and whether settlements are legal or illegal, uh, we are we should not be in the business of promoting uh, building on or incursions into um, places where their own legitimate courts have said this is not something that we can sustain from a national legal standpoint. I think that's a that is a fundamental a fundamental issue. Okay, thank you. Uh, on that note, um, thank you to all the panelists and the audience. I think we just heard from four people who know where we've been and uh, know uh, the problems that face us um, as we go forward, and they're uniquely placed. So I, I, I think this will be a great transcript, and you can go back and see the video again and revisit this entire experience. Thank you very much.